Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at Marine Corps Base Quantico for Modern Day Marine, the U.S. Marine Corps' flagship exhibition, conference, and trade show right here at the crossroads of the United States Marine Corps. And we're here on the Bell Stand to talk to Todd Warden, who is uh, Senior Manager uh, for Business Development uh, in uh, Tilt Rotor Systems uh, at Bell, a Textron company. Full disclosure, Bell uh, sponsors the Defense and Aerospace Report podcast. Todd, thanks very much for the time. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I have heard uh, so much, seen so many models of the V247, the Vigilant, uh, as you guys have been working this um, uh, extraordinary airplane. I think this is the first time that the full-scale model has been has been displayed, and it is really extraordinary. Um, talk to us a little bit about where the Marine Corps is with its requirement. I mean, this has been a process that's been, uh, for the last couple of years, all eyes have been on what the Marine Corps will want for this multi-mission um, at sea system that it wants. Talk to us about where that requirements process is, what direction you guys think it's going, because this is all your investment at this point. Correct, so we unveiled this product, this V247, two years ago right here at Modern Day Marine. Since then, we developed what was a concept two years ago to now what you see behind me. This is a, a significant investment by Bell to really mature the product that you see here. So the V247 was designed around the long range ISR mission at, at 350 nautical miles with a time on station of greater than eight hours. Really that long range persistent ISR mission designed the whole aircraft. All the other missions became fallout after that. We had that initial capability. So the Marines, to catch up, the Marines established the requirement in the aviation plan. They established the seven capability gaps. So airborne early warning, electronic warfare, persistent fire, C4, ISR, tactical distribution, and escort. An RFI was released in September. That RFI took those seven capability needs and tiered them into multiple tiers. Uh, establishing, for instance, uh, electronic warfare as a higher tier than for escort or tactical distribution. From Bell's perspective, our design is centered around that long range persistent ISR mission. So all the other capabilities, even though they were tiered, the 247 is still able to meet them. So the Marines are actually able to use what we have here to pick and choose what types of missions they want to perform using this aircraft. Uh, I mean, it, it really is extraordinary. Normally you don't see something that says Marines on it that has anti-submarine uh, uh, torpedoes hanging, two from each side. You have centerline um, ASW buoys, uh, anti-submarine warfare uh, uh, buoys that you uh, can deploy from it. Um, talk to us a little bit about the game-changing nature of this and how you get the customer to look at something that's game-changing. You guys did that with the V-22. You're trying to reinvent the whole uh, aviation game for the Army with the V-280 uh, Valor program, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that as well, about some of the DNA that's come from Valor into this. But talk to us about sort of convincing the customer that actually an airborne platform like this that's fully autonomous, that's literally almost iPad controllable, where here are the waypoints that I want it to fly. Obviously weapons release is something where there would be human intervention. But talk to us a little bit about how you're talking to the customer to attract them to change how they do business that, that a platform like this can afford. Well, well first of all, with, with, this, with the uh, torpedoes and the sauna buoys, as part of the uh, RFI that came out, the aircraft needed to be DDG compatible. And from that perspective, we started looking at the other services. We wanted to look at the Navy and figure out what it took to be DDG compatible, to be able to fold up and stow and fit in the, the hangars that are existing today. So we want to make sure we carry the mission payloads that make that, that are able to perform that ASW mission. And we didn't stop there as well. We started looking at what the Army was. We wanted to address all the services equities. The Army has a next generation UAS requirement that's out there, a BA that was just released uh, over the over the summer. And then it listed a number of requirements that we wanted to evaluate against the 247 as well. And when we did that, we started looking at their requirements for on station time, for speed, for range, uh, performance at 4K95, we, we evaluated that against the 247. We found that it was very, very complementary to what the Marines were doing already on the MUX mission. So we think what we've done here is we've taken the investment in tilt rotor technology that we leveraged from the V280, that they leveraged from the V22. We've taken that, we've applied it to this unmanned system, and not just for the Marines, although the Marines established the, the MUX requirement very early on, but we also started looking at the other services as well. We want to make sure we had a joint service approach. We can satisfy the equities of the Navy and of the Army as well. So tell us some of the specific V280 DNA that's made it into this system, um, given that there's so much about the V280 that's just radically different from what the V22 is. Okay, so uh, a big instance on this aircraft is the way we designed the wing. So the wing on the V280 was designed for producibility, manufacturability, and to get touch time and labor out of the wing to make it uh, more cost effective. 
versus what was previously done on the V22. We leverage that exact same design detail using a broad goods layup approach on this wing here. And we did deviate a little bit from what the V280 is doing. We have a little bit of a dihedral in the wing. And so what we did is we started producing manufacturing risk reduction test articles. We built up a wing box to prove out that we could use the V280's technology with a little bit of dihedral using a broad goods layup approach to produce a manufacturable and producible wing box. So we've, we've taken that DNA from V280, we've adjusted it slightly for V247 and came up with a successful design for producibility. Um, we've also looked at uh, other things that the V280 is doing as far as how they design their rotor system. We looked at that and leveraged some of that technology on this aircraft as well. Uh, well, what I think is also extraordinary about it, just like the V-22 was designed to fit in the footprint of a 46, mm -hmm. you guys have very cleverly put out the footprint of a Huey and that you guys actually fit into, into, into that footprint. Let me go back briefly to the Marine Corps requirement. So what do you think, given the fact that the Marine Corps is still evolving its, its requirement, what do you think are going to be the core elements that you guys got right with this? Is it the range? Is it the persistence? that are going to be the core elements of this and the rest of it is just plug in and adapt as necessary? Yeah, I think the core, the core mission from our perspective is the long range ISR mission with persistent capability. So our intent with this aircraft is to minimize the impact to the amphibs, to have this, the smallest uh, spotting factor required to be on the ship. So that's why we have the Yankee here. Part of the RFR requirement is that we should be fit in the same size as a Yankee. And our intent with that long range persistence is that we're minimizing the impact to the ship by having as few aircraft as required to maintain persistent orbits at range. So if you have four or five aircrafts on the, on the ship to perform that orbit, then something else has to come off, the, come off the amphib. Well, if you have the 247, you only need two aircraft to maintain a persistent orbit at range for 24 hours. And uh, you guys also cleverly have the air refueling system on it, so you can get refueled, as we've discussed, with the bladder system that goes on V-22, or be able to get it from MQ-25 or another platform. Correct, we have a aerial refueling, refueling capability on this aircraft too, um, so we can extend our operational endurance uh, for a considerably longer time. Uh, now, from a munitions standpoint, you guys have a, you know, a version of this which would carry two small di diameter bombs, which again is kind of an extraordinary capability. What's the rough, you know, give us sort of the weight of the aircraft, but also the amount of uh, payload you guys are able to carry, whether it's distributed among an ISR payload, whether it's for sonar buoys, whether it's for external stores, because you guys have a vast array of both, you know, air to air. I mean, you guys have Sidewinder capability you're willing to put on it, uh, as well as Hellfire capability. So uh, really it's about, payload really is a combination of fuel and the mission payloads that you're able to carry, whether it's munitions or mission uh, pods. Uh, for instance, on this aircraft, we are able to install on the cheek mounts uh, conformal mission payload pods, whether it's for electronic attack or some type of intelligence gathering capability. On the cheeks, we can carry the torpedoes, we could potentially carry an AMRAMs or AIM-9s. In the internal fuselage, we're able to carry SDB-2s, sauna buoys, or uh, common launch tubes that could uh, launch expendable or attributable uh, micro or small UASs. And under the wings, we have two stations under each wing capable of carrying uh, four, a four pack of Hellfire each, so potentially eight Hellfires per wing or 16 Hellfires in total. So our payload capability is quite significant, but there's a trade there. There's a trade between payload and the fuel that you put on the aircraft, and, I've, and that would impact uh, what your mission is. So if you're if you're a long endurance ISR mission, you're going to want to maximize the amount of fuel you're going to carry. If you're supporting a, a fires mission, you want to maybe you'll trade fuel for for munitions. And uh, do you, but do you have that um, a golden number? Is it four thousand pounds of payload? Is it six thousand pounds of payload? Do you guys think you'll be able to haul? That's kind of uh, so. That's uh, a. <laughs> Where we are right now in the design, that's uh, um, kind of in the secret sauce of what we're doing right. as far as air vehicle weight, right. payload, trading that against munitions. So we're, we're trying to keep that somewhat under tight wraps for the time being. Okay, fair enough, Todd. Uh, I, I saw from the look in your eyes, uh, oh, he had that look in his eyes. Don't don't go there. Um, one of the things, though, which is uh, really, really clever and uh, is uh, the refueling port, right? I mean, there are aviation bosun mates and, and Marines and everybody else who's just, oh my God, you know, why did they, they put that uh, there? Um, how much effort are you guys putting into this? Because it looks like quite a bit of effort to make sure that it's serviceable at the right place. A, a lot of the uh, line replacement units will appear to be in places where it's easily serviced. How much thought are you guys putting into the serviceability uh, of this to make life easier for, for crews that are operating it? So we're really following the example that the V280 Valor has, has led. And so what that means is we're designing for maintainability and sustainability of this aircraft from the very beginning. We want to make sure that when we design the pylons, 
when we design the avionics maintenance bays, when we design the engine bay, when we start looking at the design of the, the drive system, that it's all designed to be maintained. Uh, we want to make sure we take the, the continuous improvement and the lessons learned from V-22 and apply those to this aircraft as well, knowing that it's going to be maintained on a ship, in a shipboard and viable environment and a maritime environment as well. All the access panels, we want to make sure that they're at appropriate locations and appropriate heights so that the maintainers can get in there with ease and, and maintain the aircraft. This is all part of what we're doing from the very beginning. We're using uh, the same example that the V-280 did with the digital thread. We're using that system as well in the digital design environment to take the engineer's designs and be able to pass those directly down to the to the manufacturing capability and then down from there to the um, to the maintainers, all using the same digital environment. So they'll have the same information and are able to look at this and, and understand what the implications are, impacts are of where we choose and where we design to put the, uh, the access panels and how we do maintenance. So as you would expect with a game-changing airplane or an airplane you guys expect to be game-changing, um, you guys have an augmented reality experience uh, there, which gives you, walks you through a little bit of uh, the footprint and take a look at how the system would operate. Tell us why you did that, but also tell us that you know, how this would work with the F-35 and other um, cutting edge combat aircraft and the role that it could play, because you guys portray a very, very interesting uh, te symbiotic teaming relationship. So we have four mission vignettes on our augmented reality, uh, spanning the gamut of, of several different types of missions. So, for instance, we have an ISR EW mission where we're demonstrating a collaborative engagement with a DDG. What we're doing there is we're showing the lines of communication between the between the AMFIB, where the 247 came from, the DDG, and the sensors that the 247 has. It's able to perform uh, sensor sweeps of, a, of a, maybe a hostile area, send that information back to the DDG um, for information on how to maybe go prosecute a target. Next, we have a, another uh, collaborative engagement. This is with the F-35s. So how does the 247 work with the F-35s? Well, certain data links and sensors uh, enable the F-35 to task uh, through advanced teaming, task the, the, the V-247 to go and extend essentially the operational reach of the F-35 sensors. Also, the F-35 can use a 247 as a magazine. So the, F, the V-247 is able to carry a substantial payload of Hellfires or Jagums or SDB-2s. What the F-35 can do is the F-35 can task those West weapon systems on the V-247 to go prosecute targets as well. And then we have another mission for uh, ASW, so anti-submarine warfare. And that mission we have it also collaboratively engaging with a DDG, uh, using uh, the DDG, DDG controlling the 247, and then also a P-3. So you have an airborne asset and a sea-based asset that are both advanced teaming using data communication to task the 247 to do different operational missions. Or, or, or the P-8, right, which is, which is repla re re replacing the P-3. Um, when you guys are um, looking at, uh, you know, and obviously the F-35 is the sort of quarterback of the digital future battlefield, right, to take a line from uh, Gordon Sullivan used to say that about, you know, the Comanche was supposed to be the digital quarterback, but the F-35 very much is going to be that. One of the things we haven't talked about is the operating altitude you guys are shooting for, because while this will be a very, very agile aircraft, or at least you hope it'll be a very agile aircraft ultimately when it's produced. Um, what kind of altitude and flight profile are you looking at this? Because this would appear to be, you want it to go as high as it can, stay as, as level, predictable uh, flight path on, on like level RPMs to try to stretch the range out. So we're estimating that the altitude would be between 15,000 and 25,000 feet. We can cruise at 240 knots, we can dash up to 280 knots, but our long loiter, persistent ISR mission will probably be cruising around 180 knots. So we'll cruise at 180 knots, we'll be traveling at altitudes between 15 and 25,000 feet. And what that does for us, it presents an environment that's very uh, benign and allows the aircraft to just sit there and loiter um, using a low power setting to extend its operational endurance. And, um, and what's it going to take to get from this uh, really neat looking model to a flying airplane? So what we're doing as far as uh, get, continuing Bell's investment is we're trying to align what we're doing with what the services are doing, whether it's the Marines, the Army, or the Navy. So what we're doing is we're tracking with their requirements. Um, we're looking for any type of opportunity, whether it's a, a partnership uh, with the Marines, but we're, we're ready to take that next step. 
with the investment we made to help accelerate this program um, as they see the requirements unfold. And so a uh, couple of years, I mean, is that something you th guys think you could do in two years if you got to go ahead and order, say, for example? Uh, it really depends on what the requirements come down to. Because the requirements haven't been set, all we've responded to so far is the RFI. Uh, it's hard to estimate exactly how long that would take, um, but we're ready to move out in accelerated fashion to meet their requirements, whatever they are. Um, one last question. You guys are single engine uh, on this with uh, a new kind of shaft uh, configuration, which is different from the 280. Talk to us a little bit about that and how you guys, and if you can share with us, what is the target cost per flying hour that you're shooting for? That, I think everybody in the business is trying to do that. I know you guys are trying to reinvent that, that as good as the V22 is, uh, it does have a little bit of higher cost per uh, flying hour, which is the reason why the Mar Marine Corps went to basically seat cost per mile, because we're you're much more airplane than you are helicopter in a lot of the ways that you're, you're used. But talk to us a little bit about some of the things that you guys have done on this aircraft to try to reduce both the acquisition cost of it, but also then reduce the operating cost. Of it. So uh, what we're doing with the, with the single engine to start with is uh, single engine is, is going through a mid-wing gearbox, uh, going to our, our drive system, and there's and the property gearbox is in the pylon. So it's a very um, it's something that we're very familiar with from a tilt rotor technology, uh, distributing power that way, um, whether it's interconnect drive shafts or a mid-wing gearbox, a Bell has experience with that. And what we're doing as far as to, to drive out cost is, is that whole design for manufacturability using a digital design thread to uh, facilitate communications between the, the engineers and the manufacturing elements, so to pull those teams together to really identify what's the best way to build and design the aircraft for maintainability. I think in the long term, by having the lower maintenance cost and, and uh, better be able to support the aircraft long term, that's really going to drive the overall cost of the pro drive down the overall cost of the program. And, and no uh, target cost at this point, or you have the target cost, but if you told me you'd have to kill me, kind of thing. Somewhere that sounds that sounds good right there. I hear you Providence Rhode Islanders are, are just really ferocious yeah. when it comes to that. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> just kidding. Todd Warden, Senior Business Manager uh, for Tilt Rotor Systems at Bell, a Textron company. Thanks very much. Thank you.